Good morning, Susan. How are you? Hi, Chris. Can I'm good. Can you hear me okay? Yes, fine. Great. Your audio is terrific, too. Well, it's good to see you again. Thank you very much for joining me uh, this morning. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, for our uh, viewers, welcome to our very first uh, virtual uh, Meet the Author. Uh, many of you who are regulars know that we normally meet at the Boone County History and Culture Center uh, generally every third Saturday morning with uh, coffee and uh, snacks and croissants and donuts. And we haven't been able to do that since February, so I'm very happy. I don't get a donut? No, you don't get a donut, sorry. You had to bring your own. <laughs> Um, but do you have coffee? Because I brought my coffee. I do. Good, good. All right, we're off to a good start. Well, um, folks who are watching, uh, again, welcome. We're really pleased to be able to present this. I want to thank the, the people that make it possible. Um, our sponsor uh, throughout the year, Simmons Bank. Thank you very much, uh, everybody at Simmons in Columbia, Missouri. I also want to thank Barnes & Noble, who is the coordinator and scheduler for this series. We really appreciate all the assistance and the wonderful help we get from Lisa and Tim at the Barnes & Noble store in Columbia. I also want to acknowledge the fact that this series is sponsored by the Office of Cultural Affairs in Columbia, Missouri, as well as the Missouri Arts Council. So let's get going. I want to introduce Susan to everybody for those that maybe aren't familiar with her. I think all of you know we're here to talk uh, uh, about uh, a book called The Father of uh, Route 66, Cyrus Avery. Uh, this is what uh, Susan has written, but it's not her first uh, book about Route 66. She originally, um, or has in the past, written an award-winning book called Route 66, The Highway and Its People. And that described the life of the old road from its birth in the Roaring Twenties through the hard times of the Thirties and the war years of the Forties, um, the Fifties when American families took Route 66 to the magic vacation land of California. Today, Route 66 is a worldwide tourist attraction, but in those years, it was an economic lodestone for the people who lived at its edge and the states through which it ran. Uh, her second book, the book we're speaking about today, The Father of Route 66, The Story of Cy Avery, uh, was published by the University of Oklahoma Press. Uh, Susan, by the way, grew up along Route 66 in St. Louis, and she has worked as a newspaper journalist, a travel writer, public relations executive, she was also publisher and editor of the Ozarks Magazine, a regional magazine aimed at celebrating the unique land and people of the Missouri and Arkansas Ozarks. But she's currently editor of Ozarks Watch, uh, which is a magazine that is with and for the Missouri State Libraries and the Ozark Studies Institutes, or Institute, I should say. So um, what a wonderful bio. Susan, welcome and thank you for being here. I'm really glad to be here, Chris. Thanks. So let's jump right into it. Um, Cyrus Stevens Avery uh, might be of interest to some people. Uh, Mr. Avery was born in 1871. He was with us until 1963. So he got to see this highway really become the cultural icon uh, that it was and is. Susan, tell us a little bit about, as you wrote it in the book, and at the end, we'll, we'll talk about where people can find your book. Tell us a little bit about uh, Sai's early life and, and what, what formed him. Love to. Um, in the early 1870s, there was a depression that apparently rivaled our Great Depression of the 1930s. His father was a farmer and um, uh, livestock farmer in Pennsylvania and lost all of his money, lost everything. And his father decided that the future lay in moving west. And at that time, there was a big push uh, for people to come to Indian territory or to come to what's now Oklahoma. And uh, he and Cy loaded up most of the family's possessions and took a uh, covered wagon from Pennsylvania across, across um, the eastern part of the United States, across the Mississippi uh, to St. Louis, and then down to the far corner far southwest corner of Missouri and across 30 miles into Indian Territory where they began farming. And uh, <clears throat> the mother and sister came a couple, couple years later, but Cy basically grew up in Indian Territory and they would go back uh, the 30 miles once every month to get the mail and to get supplies. And if you think about it, he was 13 when they came across the country. 
with either oxen or uh, mules or something pulling the wagon. Wagons got stuck in the mud on those roads and he was probably called out, not by his dad, but by a lot of other people to come and help get the wagons out of the mud, you know, so that we can keep on moving west. Um, and then once, once he got to Indian territory, it was probably the same way. He went to college in Missouri, but he came back to Oklahoma and uh, first settled in Veneta, which is, which is not too far from, from Missouri and is uh, now a Route 66 town. Got into um, farm loans and a little bit into oil. He was more of an oil leasing guy than an oil driller. But again, he um, spent a lot of time out in the country trying to go see people about farm loans and, and uh, going into oil fields. And if you think about it, these roads were dirt and gravel and heavy oil equipment had to get bogged down. Heavy wagons had to get bogged down. And so I think he grew up knowing that there had to be a better way with American roads, um, which kind of focused the whole rest of his life. He became really active in um, a movement across the country to bring better roads to the United States. Now that meant just grading and putting gravel down and maybe sand for the cross country roads. There were no cross country pavements at nine, in 1900. People were working on it, but there weren't any. And um, Cy really began agitating for better roads and working with this grassroots movement that had built up across the country. Said, we've got to have better roads. And then after 1908, when Henry Ford introduced the Model T, um, people began to have cars. And if I live on a gravel road up here, I live at the Lake of the Ozarks and we live on a little gravel lane and we get, you know, a dozen cars a day, maybe going down our road. But suddenly if you had 40 or 50 or a hundred going down the road, the gravel road would get muddy. It would get rutted. Cars would go off the road. And that's what was going on. And um, <clears throat> people like Cy who grew up on the farm, who had a mechanical background and began to see the future said, we got to have better roads. And there were all kinds of manifestations of this. One of the things were these auto trails that you hear about, the Lincoln Highway. Cy was involved in one called the Ozark Trail, um, which eventually became part of Route 66 from St. Louis to New Mexico. Um, but there were people all over the country doing that and agitating for better roads. And Cy got himself elected, um, excuse me, um, presiding commissioner of Tulsa County. By this time he lived in Tulsa and um, he began building roads in the county. So he got known both in the um, PR sense nationally with people building these auto trails or, or actually uh, making brochures for the auto trails because they didn't do much about the roads. Well, let me ask you a question about those trails, yeah. whether it's the Lincoln Highway or, or roads that were specific in the Tulsa area that he played a part in. Uh, uh, define road. What what materials uh, or construction uh, uh, did those roads consist of? That's, that's really two questions. The auto trails came about because people said we've got to have better roads and they would get together and from the different towns like uh, you're in Columbia maybe we wanted a road from Gravois Mills where I live to Columbia and people would get people in Jefferson City involved and people in Eldon involved and some of the little towns and they'd all say, okay, we'll spend money. But they couldn't, they didn't have any paving material. They said, we'll keep the road graded and here's money so you can have brochures and maps. And if you read any of those old brochures, I mean, they're better than going on a major cruise. Uh, there was a, a, a theoretical road from, um, let's see, New Orleans, I think up to uh, one of the towns in Canada and it was the Palms to the Pines Highway. I've heard of that. Yeah, and um, then there were some that were named after politicians, the Bankhead Highway, the Roosevelt Highway, but it was hype really more than a, a road like, like we think about where you can travel across the country. Um, but again, people had cars and they were doing this and it was great, but they said, we gotta have something better. It turned out in 1909, the year after the Model T was introduced, uh, surprisingly enough, a bunch of road engineers in Wayne County, Michigan, which is where Ford was, did the first concrete pavement 
for a cross country road. They, there was a, a couple miles of this pavement and people like Cy came from all over the country to see it. Will this work? You know, can we do it? And um, the Lincoln Highway was one of those started by rich people. It was started by the guy that uh, founded the Indianapolis Speedway. And that was the plan was it would be the first paved road across the country, but it cost a ton of money to pave roads. I mean, think about it. There's always taxes and bond issues every time they would start to build a road now. Um, and they said, the federal government's got to help us. The, federal, the feds were worried that it was crossing state lines if you built a road from one state to another, and that wasn't supposed to be part of their job. Besides, it was going to be expensive, so they hesitated. And this um, good roads movement just kept building and building and building, and they began electing people to Congress who promised that when they got to Congress, they would build roads, you know, they would get roads for people. And um, finally, in the 1914 and again in, um, or 1916, I'm sorry, and then again in 1921, they began to pass laws to give money to the states to pave roads. But they said, here's money, pave roads, basically. And that meant that if um, Missouri paved a road from Arkansas to Iowa, and Iowa paved a road from, what is it, Minnesota mm -hmm. to Missouri, but right. those roads didn't necessarily meet. There was no plan for crossing state lines with the highways. And by this time, Cy, excuse me, by this time, Cy was uh, Oklahoma Highway Commissioner. So he was building state highways, and the other states were beginning to have highway commissioners. And they had an organization in Washington, and they went to the Secretary of Agriculture, who was in charge of the Bureau of Public Roads, and they said, hey, we got to have a national road system. Can you do something about that? So the Secretary of Agriculture appointed two dozen people to this um, joint board to go take the roads in the states and figure out which ones would connect and become cross-country highways. Am I um, right? According to your book, that didn't happen until as late as 1925? Is that about when we're talking about this right now? Yeah. Wow. Right. Right. I mean, this is a long, long proposition. And when, when, um, I was working on my first book. I traveled, we spent a lot of years in our free time with a photographer. And we talked to people who had been involved in actually paving the roads. You know, so it, that's not very long ago. Um, no, it's not. It's just interesting to me that Ford and Dodge and other automobiles had been around for 20 years already by the time uh, DC and uh, the Department of Agriculture is, is producing this joint board of interstate highways. It's hard to believe it took that long for, for that thought to start actually germinating. For Congress to do something? Well, you got a point there. <laughs> you got a point there. Actually, in the cities, it wasn't that bad. It was bad. But, I mean, if you think even, even back to, if you've ever been to Europe and all the, all the uh, uh, rock roads and the, and the brick roads, and they did that in the cities. But the idea of a cross-country highway was a whole different deal. Right. Anyway. Cy was appointed to this board, and another guy that was appointed to the board was a guy named Pipemeyer, who was from Missouri. He was a state highway engineer. And another guy was Frank Sheets, who was a state highway engineer for Illinois. So if you know the Route 66 map, right. that's a pretty important part of the highway. Um, and uh, uh, they got together, they spent about, I think, four or five months meeting with regional people to decide which, man, which highways would connect to which highways. And those would be the ones that would get paid first. This was the whole idea. Um, there were also no highway signs. So if you're on a road in Missouri and it was called um, the, the Jefferson Highway and you got to right. you know, Kansas, it was called, maybe called something else when you got there. And they wanted um, uniform numbering. Um, there were no safety signs, railroad crossing signs, stop signs. They weren't uniforms. In fact, when they got into all this, uh, the, the uh, member of the committee from New Mexico wrote to him after they had proposed stop signs. And he said, there are not enough cars in our state that we need a stop sign. That's just a waste of money. Wow. <laughs> it's really hard to believe. Yeah. Um, so, so the idea was that the, the um, 
east-west highways that went from the Atlantic to Pacific Ocean would end up with numbers. The highways were going to have numbers instead of names. They decided that the Lincoln Highway people, if they didn't follow the Lincoln Highway, would get offset. And they didn't want that kind of politics. So they said, we're going to number these new roads. And the east-west highways were going to end in zero, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. And the north-south highways were going to end in either one or five, because there's more of them. But those were the Mexico to Canada highways. So if you got on a highway that had a zero ending, you knew that you could go from California to the East Coast and that you could get there. And it was going to be a guarantee. So Cy and his buddies in this committee, they got together with everybody and they laid out the highways. And um, <coughs> it was pretty evident from maps I've seen that you could tell which, which highways they were, had, had pulled out to do this. And then Cy, I think Cy and Pipe Meyer and Sheets also were part of a committee of five who were chosen to give numbers to these highways. And they met in St. Louis and they, it, was, it was pretty much of a done deal. It was pretty obvious, except for there was this one road that went from Los Angeles, not to the East Coast, but to Chicago. And they gave it number 60, which meant that it was an important highway. And uh, uh, the Association of State Highway Officials, all the 50 states approved this. And then they sent it to the states for ratification. And um, I guess we didn't talk about how important these highways were, not just for the cars, but for the little towns. If you had a highway going through your town, that meant that there were gonna be people stopping and spending money, spending the night. It was gonna be a big deal for the, and these little towns. And if you think about, Illinois was farm country, and it's always been, I think, fairly successful farm country. But you get south of Illinois, and these little towns, even today, a lot of them are blowing away. They're just, you know, the idea of being able to bring business was hugely important. And um, so it was real important when the states looked at these maps, they wanted to see if they were gonna be on one of the major highways, if the road that went through their town had been chosen. And the governor of Kentucky looked at the map and highway 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 went north of Kentucky 70, 80, and 90 went south of Kentucky, and 60, there was a road that went through Kentucky to the East Coast, but it was numbered 62. And the road that was numbered 60 went to Chicago. And the governor of Kentucky had a fit. Uh, governor Fields was his name. And he said, Kentucky has been insulted. <laughs> this is, we are an old state, you know, we are an important state in the history of this country, and they've left us off the map for all practical purposes. Besides, he said that number 60 highway goes to Chicago, so the mob must be involved. Oh, gosh. And so he stormed to Washington, to his senators and representatives, and said, you've got to get the number of this highway changed so that the number that's going through Kentucky is 6-0. And um, the highway people said, we'll see what we can do. And they contacted Avery. And who can blame him, actually? Oh! I mean, uh, that would mean everything. I mean, in today's terms, it, 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 it would almost as if in the, this is a poor analogy, but if you can imagine in the early 1990s, when uh, the major uh, streams and arteries of internet service were being provided across the country, can you imagine the state being left out and finding out? Oh my gosh, yes. You know, because that's how important the highways were in the 1920s and 30s. Exactly. Because you, you can have all the cars you want, but if they can't go anyplace, right. it, doesn't, it doesn't do much for you. So the Bureau of Public Roads people went to Avery and said, look, you know, the governor of, of Kentucky, he's got kind of a point. Let's change your road. We'll change it at St. Louis. It can stay 60 to St. Louis, and then it can be 60 north. And, you can have, and the governor of Kentucky can have 60. And Avery said, no way in hell. No, um, why was he against that? Why couldn't he uh, just compromise and take 60 north uh, as opposed to 60 all the way, 60 without a, a direction? I don't think he was a compromising sort of a guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, you know, I've seen some letters, but I don't really know. But so he went to Washington and he said, look, the people in our part of the world trade. We go to Chicago. We don't go to the East Coast. 
So this is the road that's the most important. Right. Never mind, never mind what they'd agreed to before the number. And um, the, this fight, and then he went to talk to his congressmen and senators. And they, of course, said, we think it should be 60 to Chicago. And the uh, governor of Kentucky and his people said, we, will, we think it should be 60 to the East Coast. And they got the, the senators from West Virginia involved. And as this fight began to brew, Avery had road signs made, and I think there's some out there, although I've never seen one, that said US 60, Oklahoma. Um, he, uh, Pipemeyer in Missouri, printed maps that had Highway 60 going to Chicago. And it just got, as you can imagine, more people in Congress were getting involved. They got more stirred up. And finally, after about six months, one of the people from the Bureau of Public Roads wrote to Avery. And they said, look, Cy, we really think <laughs> that you're going to have to do something. Because if you don't, we're never going to have a national highway system. This is going to just they're going to get more people involved in Congress. And it's just going to come to a stop. And, you know, please see what you can do. So Cy sat on it for about a month. And then um, he called Pipemeyer in Missouri and he went to Springfield and they got together on the end of April and they talked about it. And I guess Cy finally owned up to the fact that the governor of Kentucky had a little more clout than he did. He said, okay, he can have Highway 60 for his road through Kentucky. Um, and um, the state highway engineer from Oklahoma was there with him. And Cy turned around to Mr. Page and said, okay, when we did all this road numbering, what numbers were left over? Because you had the major double numbers and then, then you had smaller roads, you know, all the rest of the numbers. And uh, Page looked through his notes and he said, well, he said, how about 66? And <laughs> I can remember I was sitting on the floor of Cy Avery's granddaughter's house she had all these papers and she said, here, look at them. And I'm going through this stuff and I start to see these letters. And I'm like, holy smokes, you know, it was an accident that they named the highway. But anyway, before the afternoon was over, Pipemeyer had agreed and they sent a telegram to Washington that said, if the other states, California, Arizona, New Mexico, um, Texas, Oklahoma, or Texas and little corner of Kansas. If they agree, then we will take 66 for our highway. The governor of Kentucky can have 60. And it took uh, another three months, I think, to get all the states approval. But that's where we got Highway 66. And is this, uh, you mentioned April a little earlier, is everything you're describing 1927? 19, 1926. 26, okay. Yeah. And um, then in November, the whole organization of state highway officials, uh, how, however many there were then, six, 46, 47? I don't know. New Mexico wasn't as... Yeah. Uh, there weren't I don't know. Really but anyway, they all got together and they approved. And I think uh, Governor Field was even at that meeting. And um, right. we went from there. So uh, 1927 then, um, he forms the Route 66 uh, U.S. Highway Association or U.S. Highway 66 Association. Tell us what the purpose of that was and what got accomplished in uh, the next 15 years leading up to World War II. Okay, sure. Um, remember I talked about the, the name highways and how they were a lot hype and they were a lot, you romanticized the trip and, and well, Cy was a big promoter and he was apparently a great uh, speech maker. And he decided that if he was going to have this highway and it was going to be the highway that people traveled on, that it had to be famous. And he was going to do that. Um, one of the first things he did. Oh, there, there they are. There's Cy. Yeah. Uh, bring up uh, folks. This is the, the book cover and gives you an opportunity to see uh, this visionary we're talking about and, and uh, obviously what, uh, how you can find the book, but go ahead. Didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. Um, he, one of the first things he did was steal a line from the old main, uh, what was it, the National Old Trails Highway. Um, and it called the National Old Trails Highway the Main Street of America. And Cy said, Route 66 is the Main Street of America. And 
that organization was based in, the other organization was based in Kansas City, and they were kind of miffed. And I've seen some letters that, that he shouldn't have done that. But he took the main street of America, and they hired a publicist, and they started putting ads in national magazines to get people to travel uh, US Highway 66. They printed maps, and the publicist was going around the country talking about that this was gonna be the most famous highway. He was in Oklahoma City, and he's talking about advertising and maps and different promotion. And um, somebody in the audience said, yeah, but how are you gonna make it famous? And somebody else in the audience said, have a foot race. Well, everybody burst into laughter. That's a long <laughs> foot race, you know? But at the, end of the, at the end of the luncheon, somebody came up to the publicist, whose name was Lon Scott, and said, you know, that's not really an impossible idea. There's a guy out there named um, C.C. Pyle, who is, he was a huge sports promoter. He said, have you ever heard of him? And Scott had. And he said, why don't you get in touch with Pyle and see what you can do? So they got in touch with Pyle and said, what about a foot race on Route 66? And he was all for it, except he said, we need to go to Madison Square Garden. And in 1927, 199 people from all, literally all over the world lined up in, in Southern California for what they called the uh, Great Transcontinental International Foot Race, up Route 66 to Chicago and across to Madison Square Garden. Now, one of the, I mean, that's amazing. But the other amazing thing is there were literally people from all over the world. The, the gold medal uh, Olympic runner, uh, a guy named Pavo Nurmi from Sweden, who still holds the most gold runners medals for cross long distance running. Um, Cause I keep looking him up. I can't believe it. Um, but he was there. There were um, some African tribes people and I can't remember who they were, but I think they were from Kenya who were known long distance runners. Yes. Some of them were there. This was open to all races, all nationalities. And you so didn't- Susan, this, uh, as I recall, this started in, in Pasadena. I think so. And, it, and Route 66 obviously ends in Chicago, but the promoter felt like it wouldn't be big enough or flashy enough unless they kept going all the way to New York. So that's the, right. Actually continued to New York City and a Madison Square Garden. Was there a cash prize involved? It was a total of $25,000 to the winner. That's and a lot of money back then. In 1927, that was the edge of the Depression. That was a huge amount of money. Um, and uh, they started in March, and they ended on uh, Memorial Day. And Pyle's idea was that the little towns would ante up money, and they would wine and dine the runners, and people would come in from all over. He had a carnival that had a tattooed lady and a two-headed chicken and all kinds of crazy things, and that they would come and spend money, and that's how he would pay for the race. Well, again, you know those little towns. There weren't any people. <laughs> and uh, so... Not poor, enough people. Not enough people. And the poor runners were eating a lot of fried eggs. <laughs> <laughs> there were banquets along the way, but there wasn't the food that, that Pilot expected. Uh, was, this carnival, was this carnival something that w was like an advanced team to garner? Did the carnival go in front of the runners and uh, already be set up every couple hundred miles to attract more people? It was every night when the runners stopped. They rent, would run for a day. There was a starting time, yeah. and, um, and the carnival would stop where the runners stopped. Okay. <laughs> it was, but just I mean, today, I mean, Route 66 today is not, is not populated by a lot of big cities. No. Many no. more small towns. I mean, um, you know, you've, you've got uh, Joplin and there's Albuquerque, which might be one of the largest cities along its route. But back then, I can imagine the 1920s, Route 66 wasn't going through anything that was very large. No, but it was really important. I told you, my first book was A Labor of Love over many years, but it was published th geez, 35 years ago. I hate to say that. And we talked to people, I said, who'd been around Route 66. And in some of those small towns, we asked about this race. Uh, sports the sports writers loved it. I mean, there was, it was written up all over the world regularly. And that really was the first that a lot of people in Europe and Asia, you know, heard about Route 66. But um, we met people who would say, see that road over there? See that culvert? I sat right on the edge of that culvert and watched the runners go by. 
Wow. I mean, it was incredible. And they were, this was one of the most important things that had ever happened in these towns. <laughs> I bet. So, you know, anyway, <laughs> there, weren't, there weren't very many people, but boy, was it important to the people who were there. Take us a little and, farther ahead. What, what, what is Cy doing uh, as we, what is Cy doing in the 1930s? What, what's happening to Route 66 during uh, its first 10 or 15 years? Okay, well, the idea, the publicity to get people to drive the road, but also it had to be paved. And so Cy and um, some of the other people behind, behind the organization, John Woodruff, a guy in Springfield, who was kind of Cy's partner in crime on the Route 66 Association, they were helping counties and towns sponsor bond issues to get the road paved. Uh, in Missouri, it was paved from through the state in, uh, I think, 19, early 1930s. And they had a huge celebration in Rolla. Cy gave a speech, the governor was there, all kinds of dignitaries from up and down the road. Um, so, Susan, for people that might be wondering, uh, in those first five or six years before it's paved, I think some people might not imagine that it wasn't paved from the start. Well, what was the road made of? Oh, it was dirt. Just dirt. Dirt and gravel, dirt. And gravel, dirt. Um, in Arizona, New Mexico, sand, sand and dirt. And I heard people talk about the sand roads oh, again when I was doing the first research. But one of the things I ran into was those early roads, pre-66. They said it was one of the best things that ever happened to the mule industry in Missouri because the roads were so terrible with the, with the mud and the ruts that cars would get kicked off the road. And farmers had to have extra mules in their barn be able to come and haul the cars back onto the road so they could uh -huh. keep going. Huh. So getting the road paved was really important. And it was about uh, 1938 before it was paved from Chicago all the way through to Los Angeles. Wow. Okay. And, yeah. Um, and then the 30s, I mean, that was the Depression, and so many people left parts of Missouri and Oklahoma and Arkansas and went west. And you had the um, WPA programs where you had the photographers that took those heart-rending pictures of people on Route 66. And people like John Steinbeck, who, who wrote The Grapes of Wrath, which kind of became the iconic um, Bible about the story of people traveling Route 66. Then in the 40s, with World War II, there were bases all up and down the highway. Um, and there were even German uh, prisoner of war camps in Texas and Oklahoma. I, th I know in Texas, I think in Oklahoma. And um, the, the guys traveling, were traveling to, you know, the Navy bases in the Pacific and back and forth. And there were armaments. People were building airplanes in the Middle West and sending them out to wherever. Um, and a lot of women went west to work in the armaments factories uh, because the guys were all gone. And I met a woman in Amarillo who had... Uh, worked in an armaments factory and traveled up and down Route 66. And she said, you know, she said, I knew if I could get on Route 66, I could always get home. <laughs> that just really stayed, I just thought that was wow, you know, and it's kind of an obvious statement, but still it shows, again, the impact of this highway on people. Right. Um, one of the fellows that traveled the highway to go, to go west was a guy named Bobby Troop. Um, he was from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and he was in the Pacific during World War II. Um, he came home and he told his wife that he, you know, he wanted to be a songwriter. And if he was going to be a songwriter, he needed to be in Los Angeles. So they packed up and headed back to Los Angeles. And um, his wife, they got, they went to Chicago and then they headed down Route 66, and she said, you know, if you're going to be a songwriter, you ought to write a song about this trip. Um, how about get your kicks on Route 66? And uh, so Bobby got to Los Angeles, finished the song. He found a guy named Nat King Cole who recorded it, and of course the rest is history. Was Nat King Cole the first to record it? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. you know, I don't think a lot of people know that. We think of him and the, with the song, of course, um, but it, I was wondering myself if Bobby or someone else hadn't made a little novelty record that Nat King Cole found and decided to cover, but he was the first. As far as I've ever heard. And we interviewed Bobby Troop, and, which was great fun. Um, he was married to Julie London, I think. And he said, you know, you need to talk to my first wife because that was her line. 
and he, he called her. He said, she's just over there. And we went, so we went over to see, see this, her, and um, she, she talked about the trip. And she said, yeah, you know, she said that road, it was just awful. You see, <laughs> and there was nothing to do. The food was terrible. The motels were terrible. <laughs> so she, went, she didn't give a ringing endorsement of a trip down Route 66. <laughs> and was that, was that as World War II was ending and he had come home yeah. from the Pacific? Right. Well, that's interesting because I, a lot of us uh, who've known Route 66, um, who are alive now, of course, and, and know it from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and so on, we don't think of it as that way. We think of it as a place with lots of great motels, especially, you know, what it was thought to be and how it existed in the, in the 50s and 60s. But I guess that hadn't become that yet. <laughs> I don't know. I think your memory is like a lot of people's memory because when I was, we were traveling in the 70s and 80s to, to do the first book, uh, there was some ladies in Shamrock that had, had this restaurant. We, we, were, we got acquainted with anybody we could. And um, they said, you know, our restaurant is different. We have two vegetables. <laughs> wow. So, so, Love there you have it. Um, but then the 50s, like you said, that was Disneyland opened in 1957. And I had grandparents in San Francisco and was growing up in St. Louis. And we drove, that's my first trip down Route 66. We drove the highway and went to Disneyland and, um, uh, paid vacations had just started in this country after World War II. And so you had families on the road. And so many people had been in that part of the world and uh, during the war. And then with the hype from Disneyland, that that was a big draw during the 50s. Did the, did the song we were just talking about, the famous Nat King Cole song, did that, did the popularity of that song, what kind of impact did that have on uh, vacation choices, if any? Shoot, I have no idea. I would, I would love to say that that changed everybody's mind. I suspect Mickey Mouse had a bigger influence. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you look now, and in the 60s, you had the Route 66 TV show. Uh, and in the, um, was it the 90s or, or the 2000s, the, the movie Cars? Mm -hmm. I loved, because it shows all these places on Route 66 in that little town. So, Avery, he was a promoter, and man, it was his doing, I think, I think, because if you think about the pioneers, think about what you learn in school. The main routes west were north. They were going to Northern California and the Oregon Trail, and um, I suspect that going through the Mojave Desert would have been just as big of a challenge as going through the mountains. Maybe yeah. worse. Well, so, speaking of, uh, of Sai, um, was he still, uh, as World War II ended and, and that Nat King Cole song takes off, we, was he still heavily involved in the highway at that point? Was he still promoting it? Had he moved on to other things? Was he delighted about the song? Tell, tell us about that. You know, I don't know. He, uh, after, after, he was president of the Route 66 Association in the early 30s and when they paved the road through Missouri. And after that, he really turned to doing other things. Okay. Uh, he was involved uh, in real estate nearly all of his life. That was, and he had a farm of his own. He made talks, <clears throat> but it was fun. He made talks on um, grasses. If you were a farmer and raised livestock, the kind of grasses that you had were so important to the success of the livestock. And he would always talk about roads. <laughs> he would throw it in. Um, and then in the, uh, actually it was in the 20s still, Tulsa was one of the cities that was building an airport that was on the road. There were, there were people flying all over the country uh, trying to get air, air passenger traffic and air mail to be, it was sort of the same deal as building highways. They had airplanes, but they needed to have the public recognize that these were a good thing. And um, the, uh, Ford, I think it was Ford, built airplanes, and they had a tour um, and air races to go to town, to town, to town, and, and Tulsa had a little private airport, but um, Charles Lindbergh came to town, and he said, if you don't build a real airport, we're not coming back, and so Cy was kind of a ringleader in a group of men that said, okay, we're going we're gonna to build an airport, and um, 
they, what did they call it? The stud horse pact. And I guess if you breed horses, you, you, you pay, pay the stud fees based on when, when, the, when the colts were born, you know, and then you sell, sold the younger ones. And so these men all put up a ton of money to build a Tulsa airport on the theory that the money would come back to them through the success right. of the airport. And there is a plaque. I saw it, but it was down a hall and behind a door that <laughs> commemorated the people who had built, had built the airport. But when Cy helped introduce it and was, gave a speech somewhere, he said, he said, you know, Tulsa is going to be a center of air, of air transportation. It's going to be the highways of the air. That's great. So he quit dealing with highways per se, but they never quite left his consciousness. That's neat. Well, tell us, um, uh, as we start to wrap up, we've got um, five, maybe 10 minutes left. Um, tell us uh, something more about the book, something that readers will find in the book that, uh, that we haven't had a chance to talk about yet that you want to touch on. Sight lost a lot of money in, in the 1929 um, uh, stock market crash. And after that, his life was bits and pieces of doing interesting things, but more just kind of going along. Before that, um, I talked about the, the airplanes, but the Tulsa Race Riot has come to the fore lately. People have right. talked a lot about that. And because he was involved in real estate, he was very uh, familiar with the black community in Tulsa. And uh, when the race riots happened, which was um, white Tulsa did everything, including bombing black Tulsa, because it yeah, was not so much a, you know, not so much a riot as it was a massacre by really was. white Tulsans against what was the most successful uh, black community business wise in the entire nation. It was the only time, in fact, you you probably know this that that uh, American airplanes piloted piloted by Americans, bombed fellow Americans uh, to destroy that district in Tulsa. Yeah, and you, you say it was the most successful black business district. If you think about Oklahoma, Tulsa was a very rich city. That's where lots and lots of oil, and it was an oil center. And right. so the, the black community was equally successful. There were, there were, you know, doctors and lawyers and churches and business districts and, and, um, uh, schools, lots of schools. Uh, but after the Tulsa race riots, Cy was involved with making sure people had, had food and a place to sleep. And then he was involved in several uh, lawsuits to try to get land back for the people that had owned it unsuccessfully. So he but, was defending, he was uh, defending black Tulsans or, or maybe not defending him because I don't know he was a lawyer but he was trying to help black Tulsans get yes. the land back that had been taken from them during that massacre. Right. And he was a real estate guy. So he, you know, he was familiar with, with the land laws and, and probably had bought and sold a lot of that land. Right. So um, that, that I think is, was really important. Um, let's see. I don't know. Oh, he, he, um, like I said, he was a farmer. I think he was always a farmer. I think even the roads, had to do with being able to get crops to market and making life easier for farmers. I mean, that was, that was all the time he was, he was um, always, he had a, he had a little plot of land and he had, he had some cattle out west of Tulsa and his grandchildren um, talked about going out there with him when they were little kids and how much they loved it and what a, you know, what a great place it was. But um, also, Near the end of his life, they named um, what was then Riverside Drive as Cy Avery Drive. And he wrote to a friend and he said, you know, if you get, in if you get involved in highways, you, <laughs> you know, it'll come back to you. He said this is a good, good thing. That's great. That's great. Well, fascinating man. Um, you know, as you have, have well pointed out, he was a visionary. He was extremely uh, talented and... Uh, skilled enough to go into several different fields and find success. Uh, interesting that his, uh, his personality or his brain wouldn't allow him to stay put in one field. Uh, he kept exploring and uh, doing different things. And it's, it's uh, I think, interesting to think about uh, what he might do 
uh, in today's world, uh, what kind of uh, entrepreneur he might be today. I'll tell you one of the things he would have done. Um, he was at the, near the end of his life. He loved to talk to reporters. And uh, somebody came and said, you know, what, what, what's, what's in the future? And he said, water is going to be a big issue. He said, um, they're using up the water too fast. He said, we need to get a hold of it. And I thought it was really prescient, but it was a guy who'd, who'd been a farmer. He knew about, about uh, uh, growing things. And he looked at the, what's the, what's the Arkansas River, um, but also the Illinois River, I think, goes down through there. And he said, we've got to clean up our water and we've got to take care of it. And so I think he might have been an environmental leader, or at least an enlightened industrialist. Right, right. It's interesting um, that uh, there's a little bit of a theme running through everything they did. It's, it's all uh, either um, travel related, um, and travel is not the right word, but he, he had a sense of, of what his state and the country needed in the way of infrastructure. Whether yeah. it was roads, airports, uh, or being prescient about uh, waterways and getting safe, clean water to where it was supposed to go. He, was, he considered himself, a, what do they call it, citizen servant? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think he really did. His mother had a strong influence on him. And um, that, was, that was really important. And also toward the end of his life, another, re maybe it was the same reporter, but do you have a secret of long life? And he said, you've got to have something to do, someone to love, and something to look forward to. And I thought that was a pretty good rules. Makes sense to me. Um, well, listen, thank you very much uh, for your time today. Um, I'm really uh, very happy that you are our first uh, Zoom recorded Meet the Author we've done. Uh, we look forward to doing more. Uh, appreciate your time as you're calling in from your home down at Lake of the Ozarks, right? Right, right. Well, I, look, I love to talk about Route 66 and side. I can tell. I'm going to, um, let's see, I'm going to uh, see if I can bring up the uh the book one more time the book cover to share with our uh viewers and let's see i think i can do it um for those of you watching you can probably tell very easily that this is my first uh zoom recorded interview there we go well there's uh the cover of the book um susan tell us where people can find the book uh at uh, Barnes & Noble for sure in Columbia. They've been great and I would suspect if they've run out that you can get it at Barnes & or if you don't live in Columbia, barnesandnoble.com. Yep, that's good. And, and because there are uh, coordinators um, and partners in this, we urge everybody to uh, go to barnesandnoble.com instead of amazon.com. Um, uh, spend your money with our good friends uh, there. So Susan, I look forward to meeting you in person someday. Uh, like that'll be nice. Again, thank you very much for being here. Um, we really appreciate it. And uh, thank you all of you who've been watching uh, and listening to this wonderful author. Um, support her and this wonderful subject by going out and buying that book. And Susan, um, we look forward to seeing you again sometime. Are you going to write another book at some point in the future? I'm, doing, I'm working on one right now. Uh, not about Route 66, however. It's about um, some women journalists back in the 20s in, in southern Missouri. So that, that will be a very popular subject. So when, when that's done, let me know so uh, we can bring you back. Okay. Hey, thanks a lot. Hey, thank you very much. Have a wonderful morning. Thank you, Chris. Bye-bye.